Let's now look at non-hierarchical clustering, and the most famous algorithm is called k-means clustering. This algorithm is actually behind the scenes of many applications that you're probably aware of. So let's see what's different about it. First of all, we're going to predetermine how many clusters we want at the end. Given that we set this number, we're going to try and create clusters that are homogeneous as possible inside, but are as dissimilar to other clusters as possible. This is slightly different than in the case of hierarchical clustering. The whole approach is slightly different. This time, we're going to have to have some measures of within cluster similarity, or homogeneity, as well as between cluster similarity. We're going to try and minimize the within cluster distances and maximize the between cluster distances. There's going to be no hierarchy here. And at the end, what we'll get is we'll have labels each record which cluster it belongs to. Now, what's nice about this method is that it scales beautifully to very large data sets. And that's why this is again in use in many applications. How does it work? We have an iterative procedure. We start from k initial clusters and we set k. I'll tell you in a minute how we do that. And then we, once we, every record is in one of these initial clusters, we start shifting them around. We start reassigning each record to the cluster that is, has the closest centroid. If you remember, we talked about centroids earlier. A centroid is simply the center of a cluster. When do we stop? We keep shifting records from one cluster to the other, one cluster to the other, until each one of these records is happy where it is and doesn't want to move into any other cluster because that's the closest centroid to it. What we're going to try and do is look at a small example of this and I think you'll get a good feel in a minute. So what the algorithm does is it's minimizing the within cluster heterogeneity or variance. Okay, so we specify k and that's why we start with um, k initial clusters and we'll talk about it in a minute. Then for each record, we're assigning it to the cluster with the nearest centroid. What this means is that we have to compute for each record how far it is from each one of the k centroids. Note that these are k computations per record. This is different from hierarchical clustering where we had to look at all the pairs of all the records. Right? This is much fewer computations in this case. Then, once I computed my distance from all the centroids, I assign myself, or the record, into the cluster with the nearest centroid. Once a record has been moved to a different cluster, the centroid changes as well. So we have to recompute the centroids. And then once again, compute how far each record is from each one of the centroids, see whether you want to shift it into a different cluster. And finally, when nobody wants to move, you just stay there. And that's the end of the clustering process. Before I show you the example, just a few words about how to set the pre predetermined number of clusters up front. Sometimes you will have some reason to have um, k clusters in a certain way. You might have people in different cities and you say, okay, city makes a reasonable um, clustering um, beginning, so let's just have different people in different cities be uh, the initial allocation. In other cases, I might not know that, but I might say, okay, there's a centroid that makes sense. I know that these people are, you know, the higher income people. We have an average income there and a medium income here. So I can create centroids that would be my initial um, points into the algorithm. And finally, if I have no idea whatsoever, I just start randomly. Okay, now if we're going to do things randomly, and even if we don't, this is again an exploration technique you probably want to try different initializations. So never stick to the first thing that you did. Always try a few different things and then run the algorithm again. The first two options here, note, are bringing information from the domain knowledge from external variables. And if you have that knowledge, it is very good to integrate it. Although, again, sometimes it's useful to start with it and without it because you might discover things that you might have not um, discovered had you ignored that knowledge as well. So try with and try without. Here's our small example from before. Remember we had five records, and for each one of the records we had two measurements. 
Here's that scatter plot again. What's going to happen when we apply k-means clustering in this example? We're going to have to determine a, a beginning. So we're going to determine two clusters uh, as the preset number of clusters that we want to have. So with two clusters in mind, let's randomly assign our records so that 1, 2, and 3 belong to cluster A and 4 and 5 belong to cluster B. The next step is going to be to compute the centroids. So the centroid for A graphically is going to look like this and for B is going to look like that. Let's see what's going to happen next. Before that, let's just make sure we understand how to compute centroids. So here's our little table with data at the top. And we have cluster A here and cluster B right here. What are the centroids? What is the centroid for A and what is the centroid for B? Take a minute to think about this and then start the video again. Okay, so here are what the centroids are. Remember that a centroid looks very similar to just one of the records, meaning that if our records have two coordinates or two measurements, then the centroid will also have two coordinates. And that's why the first answer cannot be true. Then, in order to compute the centroid, we're simply taking the average. So for instance, for A, we're going to take the centroid as 1, 2, and 4. That's going to be one coordinate, and 1, 1, and 5 is going to give us the second coordinate. And for that reason, we see that the correct answer is number 3. What's going to happen next? Now we're going to have to go and compute the distances of each of our five records from these two centroids. Item number one, we're going to have to compute how far it is from the centroid of cluster A. How do we do that? Well, if you look at the data again, item one had coordinates one and one, and the centroid of A is 2.33 and 2.33. So the Euclidean distance between these two points using this computation just ends up being 1.89. I can also measure how far this item number one is from cluster B and using the same numbers one and one but replacing the centroids with the numbers that belong to the centroid of cluster B. And that's how we get the distance of item one from cluster B. And similarly you can do all the other computations and fill in this little table. Look at this table for a minute. What is going to happen? Is any of the items here belonging in a cluster that it doesn't want to be in? Remember that each record should be in the cluster that has the closer centroid. So for item 1, we see that indeed it should belong to cluster A because the distance is smaller than to cluster B. How about item number 2? Item number 2 should remain in cluster A. Items number 4 and 5 should definitely remain in cluster B where they currently belong. But look at item 3. Item 3 is currently inside of cluster A, but it actually is closer to cluster B. So the next step here is going to be to remove item 3 out of cluster B, out of cluster A, and place it into cluster B. So what we're going to do now is recompute centroids after we shifted item number 3 into cluster B, because now again the centroids shifted. Look at the stars here at the bottom in the chart and you'll see what I mean. In order to recompute the centroids, we now have to look at the numbers only for units 1 and 2 to compute the centroid for A and for units 3, 4, and 5 to compute numbers for cluster B. And you can do the math and discover that these are the new centroids. What happens next? Well, now that we recomputed the centroids, we again have to check whether any of the records want to shift into a different cluster. So we're going to do the same thing as we did before, except now the computations are a little bit different because the centroids again changed. And here are the computations, and I marked by white the smallest distances. We can see that items 1 and 2 would like to, um, sorry, items 1 and 2 want to remain in cluster A, that's the gray here, and items 3, 4, and 5 want to remain in cluster B. In other words, nobody wants to shift anymore. And in this case, we just stop. And this is the end of the k-means clustering algorithm. When I applied this k-means algorithm to our data, here's what I got using Excel Miner.
I've pre-specified that I wanted three clusters, and here are the three groups of universities that belong to each one of the clusters. Excel Miner also gave me summary statistics for each one of the three clusters so that I can compare between them. I can see, for instance, that the universities with the most expensive um, expenses are in cluster three. Take a look at cluster three. Those include mostly private expensive universities. High expenses, low student to faculty ratio, a very low acceptance rate, high student quality, and a very high graduation rate. Then we have the cluster one, which has the lower um, expenses, higher student to faculty ratio, and again we see mostly public universities, but not only. Notice that Carnegie Mellon University, which looked like an outlier in the hierarchical clustering, also shows up here in unexpected places. So we kind of created three levels of universities by generating k-means clustering using k equals to three. We don't end here because the main question is what did we gain? And what did we do in order to d discover whether there's insight? First of all, we try and name each one of these clusters. And then, based on the name, we ask ourselves, so did this tell us anything interesting? In this case, again, we had these university clusters, and the question is, is there anything interesting that we could say based on the three clusters that we got there? The last step is actually when you're not really sure how many clusters you want at the end. Sometimes it's predetermined. Say you're interested in having five different offers, and you just want to divide your whole customer database into these five different segments so that each one of the segments um, will get a certain offer. That's a case where you predetermine K and it's very clear. In other cases, it might not be very clear, and that's part of your exploration. How many clusters should there be at all? And in that case, what we can do is simply rerun k-means for, for different k values. So what we're going to do here is I'll show you a small example in a minute, but just note that there's going to be a trade-off. First of all, the smaller number of clusters you have, the easier it is to interpret what's going on. Right? That's simplicity. On the other hand, when you have too few clusters, you're bunching records that are very different from each other. You're forcing them to be together. One nice chart that helps us find when is the sweet point is called an elbow graph. And what we're going to measure is that homogeneity, that within cluster homogeneity, and see how it changes for different numbers of clusters. You see on the x-axis, I try one cluster, everyone together, then two clusters, three, four, and five, and here I'll just have the average homogeneity um, within cluster as things as I increase the number of clusters. Now this is obviously going to decrease and decrease because as you break your data down further and further, the clusters are going to be more homogeneous. The question is going to be when is there a big drop? And that's where we gain the most. So here's running our university's example again. Remember before we set k equals to three and here were the results on the right side. And now I ran the same algorithm with k equal to 2. The top tables show us the distance between the clusters. Look at the 2 cluster example versus the 3 cluster example. Of course the distance becomes bigger when we are looking at more clusters. Now look at the bottom tables that tells us about homogeneity within clusters, the average distance inside a cluster. We see that, of course, as we break things down more and more, we get more homogeneous groups, as we see here. But note also that we also can see how many records we have when we break things down further. So for instance, in the two cluster case, we had 6 and 19. And when we force the k-means to separate things out to another cluster, the 19 separated out into 11 and 8. Here's that elbow chart where we reran this model for two clusters, three, four, five, and six. We did cluster analysis six times, sorry, five times. And we can see that the biggest elbow is moving from two clusters to three. This seems like where you get the biggest gain in terms of more homogeneity. From three to four is not such a big gain. Maybe from four to five you're actually gaining again. You can see this is a subjective process and you just really need to rerun and look and ask yourself, what have I learned?
Finally, as with um, hierarchical clustering, there are going to be some computational issues, um, issues of convergence and robustness. And again, things can change as a function of small changes. I don't want to get into any details. There's an interesting link down here that you can follow um, and find some critique of k-means. But I'll remind you that this is a very popular algorithm. And there are also lots of different tweaks and changes and adaptations to address some of these issues. So let's wrap up k-means. What are the good and what are the bad? First of all, as I mentioned earlier on, this is very, very popular because it's computationally very fast, even for large data sets. It's also very useful when the number of clusters um, it makes sense from a business point of view. If you have a certain number of offers or a certain number of decisions in mind, and you really want to constrain the result to be a certain K. Some bad. Well, it sometimes can take long to terminate if things start shifting back and forth. The other things are computational, such as not necessarily finding the global optimum in terms of the clusters that you're supposed to find. There can be some issues with initial partitions. And two things that are a lot less computational is one, that if you're not sure of the number uh, k, then you're going to have to rerun the algorithms for different values of k, and then look at things like elbow charts. Unlike hierarchical clustering, there's no nice chart to summarize the results and to look for insights in a graphical way. Of course, you can still look at charts um, for separate clusters, uh, such as profile charts and summary statistics, but there is no dendrogram similar to what we had in hierarchical clustering. So now, think carefully about the data that you have and how you would use clustering and whether you should use hierarchical or non-hierarchical, or maybe both to check robustness if the data set's not too large, and go and try out some stuff.